Hi. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it'll be posted to our website later for you to watch at your convenience. And I will show you at the end of today's show where um, the recordings um, all are. Uh, um, for those of you not from Nebraska, although I don't know if we have very many non-Nebraska people here for today's show, but anyways, uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, similar to your state library. Uh, and so we provide services and training and resources to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live um, for all types of libraries public, academic, K-12, schools, um, corrections, museums, historical societies, archives, uh, really anything and everything. Our only criteria is that something to do with libraries, uh, something cool libraries are doing, uh, book reviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that come on the show sometimes to do presentations about things that we are doing here through the Library Commission, uh, but we also bring in guest speakers sometimes, and that is what we have today. Uh, with us this morning is Scott Childers. Good morning, Scott. Good morning. And he is the um, executive director of our Southeast Library System um, based here out of Lincoln, Nebraska. Uh, for anyone who might not know, uh, in Nebraska, we have four regional library systems geographically in the state uh, that provide, that are kind of a outreaching of the Library Commission. Um, they're not uh, places, they're not a library system as many states may think of where you join it as a member. They just provide resources and services and training and things in their area. And Scott being in the southeast corner of the state, that's his, his area. And luckily also for us, Scott is, and I'm not going to put any pressure on you, our expert on the Nebraska Open Meetings Act. <laughs> yeah, no, no pressure whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, he is going to talk to us about some uh, changes coming to the act. Um, also want to say before we do get into his um, session here, um, thank you everyone for uh, your patience with our bit of confusion over some dates and presenters in the last two weeks on the show. We did have two weeks in a row where the presenters had other um, things come up and weren't able to present. Uh, last week's show was canceled because um, it was too late. Um, and this week's show, which was going to be on retirement, uh, is going to be rescheduled. We are still looking to waiting to see what the new date will be for that one. So if you are interested in retirement, uh, that was something to look forward to. We'll announce that soon. Uh, but luckily, Scott was able to fill in right away for us um, last week. Uh, so we knew that we'd have him on this week to talk about Nebraska's Open Meetings Act. Um, so I'm seeing here, actually, as I'm looking at my screen and what everyone else is seeing, it looks like, Scott, that your camera has frozen up, but you're still there, correct? I'm still here. Um, should we just drop the camera for today? I think we can, yeah, since we're having some diff some technical issues with it earlier, and now it looks like yours to me, it's not a bad sc frozen screen, but um, like you're not making a weird face or anything, <laughs> but it is... Uh, uh, just stopped dead. So yeah, let's go ahead. Go ahead and unshare your webcam. Yeah, and I'll undo mine too because I don't. I don't need to be the only one in here. And we'll just have the slides up for today. Um, okay. No problem. It's not a requirement that we have our faces up on the screen. Sometimes the technology just doesn't like to cooperate, and not a problem. So um, yeah, Nebraska's Open Meetings Act. Um, if you are, you know, I see everyone who is here today is Nebraska, so that's great. Um, but if anyone watches this later in recording, um, if you are not from Nebraska, please be aware we are specifically talking about Nebraska. Uh, check your own state. <laughs> I want to make that disclaimer at the very beginning. And I'm sure you're going to mention that too as well, Scott. Um, but I will just hand it over to you to tell us all about what's um, happening with our Open Meetings Act now. Okay. Okay, disclaimers. Uh, you already gave my second disclaimer. We are talking specifically about Nebraska state statutes. Um, so let's reemphasize that. I'll also put in my usual disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer. More importantly, I am not your lawyer. If there's an actual legal case 
uh, that you're dealing with, talk to a legal professional. Um, today's session is for educational purposes, not actual legal advice. So just get that disclaimer out of the way. Yes, very important. Um, for questions, feel free to, to put them in the chat box or at least let Krista know. And um, so that way I can kind of keep going. I can had to hide some of the chat screen uh, chat box on this screen so I can see my slides. So let's move on. So what is it? Uh, again, we kind of talked about, and Krista kind of talked about it in the intro. So we have a set of state law that require public policy to be done in a transparent and public manner. Um, for us, in our state statutes, it's sections 84-1407 to 84-1414. This is state law, not federal law. So that's where it resides. Almost all governmental councils, boards, and other groups must comply with this act. This includes governing and advisory library boards. Mm -hmm. um, I think almost all of our public libraries are based in either city, township, or county. So this applies to you. Um, there are a couple that are just kind of starting up and they're run as a nonprofit with a 501c3. That's a bit murky, and I'm not going to get into that at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and, and they're like some super small ones. And so um, that's in a special case. I also want to note during this talk, I may use the phrase public body. I am talking about the board on this case. That's kind of the phrase used in state law for this, the public body is the board. General public or citizens is referred to the non-board members. All right. So there are a couple parts in state statute about the meetings. Most important one for, I think, is advertising the meeting because it's so easy to get wrong and it has changed in recent years. So if you've been following the same protocol for the past 20 years, you may actually not be following the law as it reads down. So uh, the state statute says the public is given reasonable advance notice about the meeting. In state law, it does not give a set number of days for this. It just uses the term reasonable. Most of what I've seen is about 10 days is a guideline. It's not law, it's a guideline. Your community may be using a different format. You may actually have local ordinance that says our meetings are posted by this time. But the public is given this advance notice before the meeting. A recent change in communities of population of 5,000 or less, this notice consists of either placing a notice in the newspaper that covers the community, or you can post a physical notice in three different locations within the community. And those um, locations must be kind of standard every time you post. You're choosing at least those three for the same. Mm -hmm. um, those could be anywhere in the community, library bulletin board, village office, the gas station, the tavern, the school, whatever works best, that way the public has a chance to see it. If you're in a population larger than 5,000, a notice must be placed in a newspaper that covers that community. Again, this came into effect, I wanna say two or three years ago, so it's pretty new. And I was talking with a, one community, they didn't realize this had changed um, as we were talking about some other thing with Open Meeting Act. So, please be advised to, to take a look at what's going on as far as when you have to post. Yeah, that was something that I kind of just mentioned briefly, the fact that there's some changes. Um, and there hadn't been changes for a long time, for quite a few years, I think. Um, and I know there, yeah, there was something a few years ago and then just in this year too, uh, some recent or upcoming maybe yeah. changes so yeah that's definitely something to be aware of that if you have an old we we had previously had given out to libraries um a poster of the open meetings mm -hmm. act rules uh and we're working on getting updated ones our league of nebraska municipalities has provided that to us in the past um uh there are changes coming i think may be coming 
going into effect next month, correct? Yeah. Yeah, and I'll talk about those at the end. Right, of, and so um, we're hope probably after that they would then put out a new poster that would include the changes. Um, so at some point there'll be some some new ones of that. So if you have a current poster that you've been using and referring to, um, that's the thing too that you know it needs you have that has to be posted where we hold these meetings. Um, be aware that it may have changed and look on uh, online for the current version of it. Um, you can just Google actually Nebraska Open Meetings Act and it'll put you right to the pages where they have the, whoever's the current rules. Yeah. That's how I do it. <laughs> There's actually, uh, there'll be a link in the documentation awesome. uh, that I provide to you afterwards that will have a link to the current, uh, the current posted law. Great. So you'll yeah. have access to that uh, directly without having to do a lot of searching for okay. it. Yeah, and I should have mentioned that too. Yeah, that the slides that Scott has here, um, he sent me already a Dropbox where all there they are and other documents. That you'll all you'll have access to all of this afterwards with the recording. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. All right. So, um, all right. So I did this uh, slide. Let's go to the next. Continuing on about the posting and advertising, there's some things that you have to have in your posting of the meeting, time and place of the meeting. The agenda of the meeting, and I'll talk more about what this composes of uh, later, or a statement of where the current up-to-date agenda can be viewed in person and where, where it is kept. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the next slide. Your posted agenda can be changed up to 24 hours before the, the start time of the meeting. So let's say your board meeting starts at 7 o'clock on Tuesday, you can change the post, posting up to seven o'clock on Monday. So you have that 24 hour where the post agenda cannot change, um, but you can change it in between. Uh, there was a situation, I was going to a village to visit the city board about some problems with the library board. They actually changed the start time that morning. Um, so yeah, that was, not the right thing to do, <laughs> uh, especially changing time and place. You really can't do that um, within that 24 hour period unless it's an absolute emergency. So those things- Wow, that's, that's cutting it really close, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's not, yeah. But let's say just that whole uh, village board got voted out as their terms ended. There, there were a lot of unhappy people for many reasons, uh, but let's move on, shall we? Um, okay, the agenda. One thing about the agenda is you have to have enough detail that an or a citizen or person not on the board can understand what topics are being covered. My example here, the agenda item being listed as getting books. There's no real information about is this Purely procedural? Are you looking for a new collection? Are you applying for a grant? What What's going on? There has to be some meat on that agenda that someone can look at and go, I'm interested in this topic. I will attend or I will make sure I read the minutes afterwards or I will talk to my representative and, and give my opinion on the matter before the meeting. There has to be enough that a person can have a pretty good idea of what's being talked about so that way they can have a voice on that matter if they so desire. And this is, this is a big failing in many of ours, not just library boards, but city boards and so on, where it's just this random list. Um, this really comes into play on business items, things that are being voted on. You definitely want to have some sort of context built into that agenda. Um, and we also mentioned you could post the agenda, which is what we traditionally do. Uh, more and more I'm seeing where, especially in newspaper ads where they charge you by the word or letter, you just say the agenda will be found at the library circulation desk and will be kept up to date, continuously up to date there. Um, so that's another thing that didn't make the slides, but I want to mention is there seems to be more of what's happening is that the agenda is being um, not posted physically complete, but they're saying for more information, go to this place. As long as that is able to be uh, looked at during reasonable hours, 
um, you're fine with that. There's one village I was just talking with the other day. They keep the agenda taped on the inside of the window facing out to the sidewalk. So at any time there's a change, they can just quickly go out, tape the new, new agenda up, and people can see it if they're really interested walking past the window, um, even if the building itself is closed. So that might be an option. Um, okay. So that would be a good time. If there's questions on the agenda, building that, go ahead, throw something in the uh, question box. Uh, I'm just gonna take a quick peek here. I'm not seeing anything pop up in the chat, uh, but please feel free to put a question in there. I'm gonna go ahead and start on the public's rights. Um, so the people attending the meeting, not the board members up front, Oh, wait, we do have someone that just typed something into the questions. Sometimes Excellent. we can't see if someone is actually in the midst of typing. We have to wait till it pops up full. So. Gotcha. Um, but it's a good question. Can the agenda be posted online? Um, here, here's the thing. If you read literally the state law, that does not count as a posting. Really? Um, as far as current status of things. You certainly could do that in addition to the newspaper ad or article and the physical posting. There's nothing preventing you from doing it. And in fact, I think that's a really great idea, especially if you use that the current agenda will be found on the website. You know, that's your out for that. Uh, the, the full agenda is available on the web, website. So you can work with it, but that can't be the sole notice that an agenda exists. Does that make sense? For, for so your notice in the newspaper or the notice posted in a bulletin board or in your window can say, go to this, go to the library's website at blah, blah, blah for the agenda. And that follows the rule of the law. That's that's my current interpretation. I haven't heard anyone, any actual lawyers going against that, nor have I seen court cases against it. Mm -hmm. um, and then that also gives you just the one place for whenever changes happen, all you have to do is change the agenda on the website yeah. and your notices are still accurate because people still go there for the agenda. Yeah, especially in this new requirement that things are posted in the newspaper and most of our newspapers are not giving that space for free to the city. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, something like that might work really well. Um, if you are doing that, I would probably lead towards a direct address to the agenda, not go to our website and look for meetings, then look for agendas and look for this. Right. Um, so yeah. library, something library.com slash library board meeting yeah. agenda would be the URL. I mean, yeah. Right. Um, another question, if there is a change to the agenda, do you have to like, because what I just described is <clears throat> you put one notice up that always says go here for the agenda. But if there's been a change, do you need to put like a special notice out saying there's been a change to let people know that there's been a change? Or do you just um, let them realize so, that by, at the time that they go to the agenda that it might be different from when they looked at it yesterday because something changed? Yeah, it, it kind of depends how you posted it to begin with. If you posted a, a, a fairly complete agenda, um, you do not have to say before the meeting, yeah, the agenda got changed. You know, you don't have to send out an extra notice, but you do have to mention in like in your meeting, the agenda as of this date. Ah, um, okay. You know, there, there's some of that type, type of thing. That's why a lot more uh, places are using that kind of out that I mentioned is like a current up to date will be found X mm -hmm. and then it's up to the citizen to double check that right before the meeting. If they look um, at it a week before and then think that that's the agenda a week later, that's on them that they didn't check to see that something had been updated. Yeah, there, there's nothing in state law that says there has to be an additional notice. Um, hey, go recheck the agenda if you looked at it yesterday, you know, nothing like that in state law. Okay. So. Okay. All right, thank you. That's the questions for the moment. Type in anything, right. whatever you think of it, everybody. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about the public. 
uh, not again, not the board members, the actual public, the citizens of, of the town or county or township, whatever the meeting is. So the public has a right to attend, record, broadcast, make notes, they have to make comments during the meeting. The public body can create rules uh, regarding how that happens, and in some cases, temporarily prevent. Um, but they cannot outright outlaw any of that for all meetings. Okay, so some examples. Setting time limits on public comments. So all who want to make comments have the ability to do so. You're doing this so everyone has a chance to make a comment who wants to. Um, this is becoming more and more prevalent. We've seen many board business meetings getting overrun with public comment time. You know, the, the business actually takes half an hour, but there are three hours of public comment. So the board can set time limits. That is within their right again, to make sure everyone has a chance to make comments if they want and to get the business done. Uh, there, it is a business meeting. They have votes to take and reports to read. So, so a board can do that. You can restrict location of recording devices so they don't impede another attendee's ability to see, listen, or record for themselves. So my example on this is you cannot set a big old-fashioned video recorder right in front of the board chair's face because that prevents someone who uses lip reading to actually see what's going on if they're hard of hearing and they're a lip reader. But you can say you can record, but cameras have to be, you know, in the back so people have a can see what's going on at the table or off to the side or or things of that matter. You know, same with microphones and things like that. So there can be restrictions, but they can't outright outlaw those type of things except there is a thing about closed sessions i'll get to later as well but mm. so there are some cases where i have to remind say the library board president they can attend and they can record the whole meeting that is their right you know and they can make notes uh, for their own use they, uh, the people up front can't say that you cannot take your own notes. They cannot block reporters from the from all of the meetings every day. So something to to keep in mind as we deal with this. Um, so uh, we do a question about yes. the time limits. Um, mm -hmm. Can the time limits be set on the fly, or does it have to be formal um, and like in the board's bylaws? They can be set on the fly. It's usually best if you set if it's kind of a standard. That's the best, but it may not be always possible. Um, for example, I was at some hearings at the Unicameral, and they kind of did a quick count of how many people were planning to talk, and they divided up the time by the about mm -hmm. the amount of comments they had. So something that didn't have a lot of people there people had more time something that what the room was flooded and there were people out in the hall people only had like three minutes max hmm. uh, so you could do something at that time say okay seeing how many people are interested in speaking um we've got to limit our our public comment time to five minutes three minutes what and then you. at least everyone gets the chance to say get their say in yes yes okay so, so you could have a standard in your bylaws saying, you know, basically, you know, it could be this unless, you know, under special circumstances, we would, like, if you want to have something in your laws that bylaws that say, here's what we have for that, um, we allow this much time, but changes can be made depending on, yeah, the situation. Yeah, yeah that that is my understanding uh, for your own internal policy. Uh, I do also want to caution you that how, if you are writing something like that, give yourself the maximum amount of flexibility you can. Because mm. um, so, sometimes stuff just pops up out of nowhere. Uh, I was at a village board meeting where 10% of the population were actually at the meeting wanting to talk. Wow. Uh, yeah, it, it, there were multiple issues at that meeting. So, <laughs> um, okay. so yeah. 
Uh, was there another question there, Krista? Or? Uh, nope, that was it. Okay. Uh, let's continue on here. Uh, the public body, so the board, cannot require the public to identify themselves to simply attend the meeting. So anyone can walk into the village board meeting. Anyone can walk into the library board meeting, right? You do not have to identify yourself just to attend. Um, you do not have to require an individual to be on the agenda prior to the meeting just to make comments on something on the agenda. So you do not have, you cannot require a pre-authorization uh, for public comment. And I, hopefully I made that, that part clear. Um, the board can require someone making a public comment to disclose name and address, um, unless there is some protection order, for, you know, sit, oh, witness protection program thing, law enforcement are on the case. Um, but you can say so and so from you know this place of the village because if you're talking about something that affects the community and some outsider is making a big stink about it, well, do you really have to listen to that person when everyone else of the community is okay with what's going on? You know, so you can make that distinction for an actual public comment, and uh, you can have some meetings currently without time for public comment. Uh, there was a bill that got introduced, I can't remember if it was last year or the year before that, to remove that ability. That didn't pass. Um, but you can say, you know, this is a working meeting on policy. We're not doing the vote at this meeting. We're doing it next week. And so we'll take public comment then. Or you can, today's your day for public comment. We won't take public comment at the next meeting on this issue. You can do that as long as there is some time for public comment. Um, and I, generally, it's a bad idea to continuously not have public comment and just do it at some random meeting uh, without much notice. Uh, that, that falls into that bending the rules um, type of thing that you would still get kind of I don't want to say punished for, but you certainly could have the county attorney or the state attorney general telling you that you can't do that. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I made that clear. There, there are some flexibility in this, but you can't withhold the public's rights continuously. That's the main thing to remember. Okay. Um, and let's touch on something Krista already brought up, posting of the act. Okay, so previously, you didn't even have to have it posted. You could just have it available somewhere that's easily accessible. Court cases have kind of changed that interpretation. There has to be a semi-permanent post. Um, that does not mean you have to have one of those League of Municipalities posters. You could have like all of the pages of the act in a binder attached by a, a rope on the bookcase away from the front, you know, the board table. Um, so it's still kind of a semi-permanent fixture. You point out where it's at, people can refer to it during the meeting, and it can't get easily taken out of the room. So th that's kind of where you need to have your mind on that posting requirement. Um, a poster works best because it's there, everyone can see it. You can see someone taking it off the wall or rolling it up. Uh, it, so uh, it, a poster is probably your best option, but you know you can print out the pages of the act um, and stick those on your wall. That'll, that will suffice, uh, just as long as you know, it's not tucked away and so someone could remove it. Um, there were some cases where someone put like a binder up on the board table where the board was having active discussions that did not satisfy requirements because there's a lot of pressure not to approach that table during the meeting because it's you know you're, you're now making a spectacle of things so that's why they don't like something right at the board table where the board members are doing business um, so hopefully that kind of clears up the, the requirements. 
again, those posters are the best because they're big, they're, you know, put them on the wall and you, you've got it taken care of. So, and, um, before I get into minutes, are there more questions on the public posting bit? Uh, yes, let's see okay. here. All right. Lori just posted something pretty long here, so I'm going to read it all. Uh, we have the open meetings law in a frame. It is hung on the wall in our boardroom. If we need a larger room, we take it off the boardroom wall and prop it up on a table against a wall in the conference room. Okay. Does that work or do we actually need to hang it up if the meeting is in a larger room? Okay. Um, if it's still in that big frame, I think that counts because no one's going to be able to, you know, tuck it underneath a jacket and run out the door. <laughs> it's pretty, you know, accessible by the public sure, uh, sure. To, to refer to. So I think you, you probably would be fine with that. Um, she said, yes, it's poster size. It's that big poster one. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't seen anything in the in the annotations of this act against, you know, something like that. Um, again, it, it, the main focus is, can it be easily looked at during the meeting uh, without interfering in the business of the meeting? Mm -hmm. And will it be very noticeable if someone tries to remove it from the, the room? Those are kind of gonna be your keys as far mm -hmm. as current interpretation goes. So that table would be somewhere similar to where you would have put it on the wall, but just like on this over to the side somewhere. Yeah. 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 Or an easel or something. Sure. You know, so that would work. Um, there, there are some libraries. I know they have like one poster of the, the open meeting act, but they move that from room to room, depending on which room has the actual meeting. Sure. Uh, in their case, they don't have it in a frame, so they just like use some of that poster putty, put it oh, up right. on the wall. Um, so it, that works. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, all right. Any more on the the posting part of that? No, not right now. All right. So let's get to minutes. This is another thing where sometimes we we kind of lose our way on. So in the minutes, minutes shall include time and place of the meeting, the members present and absent, and the substance of all matters discussed. Okay, so it's not just, here's a copy of the agenda and we took out agenda and replaced it with minutes and that's that's what we did. There has to be some, some discussion on what happened, what was brought forward. So that way it can be referred to later. Any vote will be done by a roll call vote with each member's vote recorded in the minutes. Um, this roll call vote can be waived if there's if you're doing a secret ballot for officers. And that's about the only re reason why you, you can skip that. Um, I know this is one of those cases where we, we tend not to do it because often it's a unanimous thing, um, but the vote still has to be done by roll call. That's in the state statute. Um, <laughs> minutes and all documentation received or disclosed will be available for public within 10 days of the meeting. Um, if you're a smaller community, you can get another 10 days if the person in charge of the minutes falls ill, because usually in those cases, there's only one note taker. Um, and, and so if they, they can't fulfill it because they go to the hospital, you're given some leeway. Um, so, it, it, here's a thing where I've heard many different interpretations from city attorneys, the documentation. Um, most of the interpretations I've seen is if, say, the librarian goes to the library board uh, meeting and shares a, a, a copy of the training or the, the program calendar for the upcoming month, that should be included in with the rest of the minutes because it was dispersed at the meeting. Um, there are some city attorneys that say, as long as that information is in the written minutes, you don't need that extra piece of paper. So there is, depending on how your attor city attorney is handling it, that could change how you actually implement that part of state law. Um, 
I'm not going to argue for or against any of city attorneys because they're the ones who would be defending you if someone does create a stink about something. So ask for their advice and follow that. Um, if they don't give you any advice, I tend to suggest any document that's passed out during the meeting um, has to be available for the public during the meeting anyway. Might as well put that in the minutes so the, your minutes can just say refer to this document instead of recreating it in the actual minutes. So that that's that's one of those things that a lot of people handle differently because their attorneys interpret it differently. And there's not a good court case that kind of really defines what should be. Hmm. All right, we do have a question about the voting. Okay. Um, let's see, let us know. We do we do a roll call vote, but stay in the in the minutes by voice vote, unanimous approval, or specify who for and against if there's division. Um, so like- so Is that okay for unanimous approval since all members present are listed as well? Most of the interpretations I've seen are now okay with that, um, especially if you list out like abstentions. You know, mm -hmm. say Bob doesn't vote and so you list Bob as the abstention. You know, there's, you can still figure out fairly easily who voted for, who voted against, who abstained. Um, but then I've seen other interpretations where it's like, no, it has to be a person vote and it's recorded per person. And so you have like five lines, you know, like Bob, yay, Jan, nay, you know. Um, again, that's one of those, how's your city attorney going to defend that? Um, if in doubt, I, I say list them. So, but yeah, list them or check and see if your city attorney has a preference that they want you to do. Yeah, yeah. So and it, it, yes, to the extensions, of course. Yeah, they would list those definitely. Yeah, um, but you you definitely at least at the very least make sure it's it's shown who vote. You know, someone can look at it and say, I know how this person voted on this issue. Right. As uh, not many people do this, but some people do. They look at how their representatives vote on issues, and that decides if they will support that person's campaign, um, whether they're elected or appointed, and there's public input on that appointment or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has to be available to someone so that way they can see how the representatives are voting on things that they may be interested in. That's the key point remember in that vote um so it's, i if you're following something that helps someone figure that out i think you're okay yeah. but again i'm not your lawyer so talk with your your city attorney if you're really worried about how that handles or look at how the the village board or city council handles vote recording and follow that lead I mean, we not even have to talk with the city attorney. If you've got that sample, you can just kind of copy that you're following the procedures of the city. Right. Yeah. There may be something already yeah, out there that says what all city boards should be doing as far as your yeah. city is concerned. Yeah. yeah. Um, we do have a question about making the minutes and documentation available to the public. Uh, mm -hmm. Do we have to post the minutes and documentation or just have them available for the public to look at if they wanted to like come in and ask for them? This is actually something I'm going to get into a little bit later because there is a recent change uh, that stayed in July. Uh, that's a good question. And if I don't cover the entirety of that question at, by the end, please bring that back up. That that is a change kicking in next month. Okay. Other questions on that? Not right now. Nope. All right. So I'm going to move on to closed sessions. I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Just want to let you know that closed sessions can happen where you ask everyone to leave or the board leaves the room and have private discussion. However, it's only for certain types of topics. State law lists 
for most of the boards, most of the public bodies, there are four points. Some like hospital things have a fifth, and then there's another one for land grant things. If it doesn't fall neatly into one of these categories, you should not be going into a closed session. Okay. So those topics are strategy sessions, respect to collective bargaining, if there's a union type thing, real estate purchases, litigation, or possible litigation um, that's going to affect the public body. Discussion about security personnel and devices, like actual logistics of how that happens. Um, investigative proceedings regarding allegations of criminal misconduct. Um, so yeah, that's pretty important not to be influenced by the public, on especially early investigations. Um, evaluation of job performance of a person when necessary to prevent needless injury to the reputation of a person, and if such person has not requested a public meeting. So, for example, the library board wants to have a closed session about their librarian and says we're going to the closed meeting and we're going to talk about their performance. The librarian can say, no, I want that to be a public discussion. I, I do not I do not allow you to go into closed session for this because you're talking about me. Uh, according to what I see in state statute, they can do that. Um, that the library can make that suggestion and have it stick. Um, I heard someone say that they were advised that only union personnel or unionized personnel have that option. It's like, no, this is state law, not a union contract. State law says that the person can request a public meeting for the evaluation if necessary. And in some cases, that is in that person's best interests that they feel that the board is biased and they would like a public opinion. The same with some of these other issues. Uh, I have seen some cases where, you know, all of a sudden there's this super secret meeting and no one's really sure who is in that private meeting and what they're talking about. That is an absolutely no go. Do not do that. Do not suggest doing that, especially if it's full boards. If you can't, in an open meeting, say we are going into closed session to talk about this, and it falls into one of those four things, you should not be having a private meeting, especially with a full board. So, um, like I said, other types of boards may have other eligible reasons. Healthcare related boards have some healthcare is issues that could be kept private and so on. So, one, do not do this yourself, and two, be careful if your city starts doing this towards the library. Okay. A little bit more. Both the reason for the closed session and the vote to go into the closed session must be done in the public part of the meeting. The only matter discussed in the closed meeting is the matter stated, and then any vote on that matter has to happen outside of the closed session in front of the public. So the closed session is not for voting, it is for discussion only, and the vote happens outside of the closed session. Another thing where things could go awry if you're not following this order. So, um, so that's closed session. There, there are some other little bits in state law if you ever get into this, but hopefully this is enough to keep you out of trouble. Take a quick pause, see if there's closed session questions. I'm not seeing anything pop up. I'll let you know. All right. On a related matter, social events. This gets asked a lot. Um, there is an actual statement in the Open Meetings Act that allows more than a quorum of members to get together at functions. And this is a quote, I, need, I wanted to get this in there as a quote. It does not apply to chance meetings or to attendance at or travel to conventions or workshops um, where no, no meeting has you know, intentionally convened if there's no vote or action taken regarding anything that that board has control over. So small towns, you all show up at the high school to watch you know, the sport that all of you have kids or grandkids are at, that's fine. You're not going to get in trouble. 
um, you know, other social events. You know, you all happen to be in the same building. And because you're there for that event, not for a board meeting, you're fine. Um, even like the library book sale, right? There's been some questions on this. You could all attend, or like a library fundraiser, you can attend as long as you're not making votes or having discussions with the other board members about library business. Um, some boards kind of say, we'll take shifts, you know, only two of us at a time, or we'll make sure we're on different walls, you know, you'll be by the north wall and you'll be by the south wall. And yeah, that kind of gives you that added sense of uh, protection. But um, so yeah, social events, things like that. Um, you're not breaking the rules about congregating. Now, let's say, I know for some of our libraries, the Friends or Foundation Board often have the library board members attend or are actually part of those groups. Um, that is one of those things where normally a Friends or Foundation meeting wouldn't have to be advertised as an open meeting. But if you've got more than a quorum of library board members there, especially if they're also voting, um, those need to be under Open Meeting Act uh, because there is a, more than a quorum of that board uh, talking about the business that they are a board for. So that, hopefully I made that clear on, on those type of things. Um, I know for a long time, most of our foundations were library boards plus a couple extra. Um, that was kind of best practice back in the 80s. Now it actually becomes problematic. So uh, because, yeah, now you have to follow the Open Meeting Act if that's the makeup of your foundation. So. Yeah, so I think the key here, because this is something that I know some libraries have been confused about or concerned about that we're not allowed to all go to the thing. <clears throat> it actually depends on what you do when you go to the thing, <laughs> go to mm -hmm. the event. Yeah, you know, they understand, like you said, you're, you may end up at the same birthday party or the same football game. That's okay. Just don't do any board work while you're there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, now there are cases, let, let's take for example, I will often go to a library board to do training but they're also kind of usually doing some other business since they're all there together. In those cases, yeah, absolutely make that an open meeting. Uh, most of the business will be in a training session, but just in case something comes up, you're at least covered. Um, but yeah, let's say you're all going to the NLA conference. Yeah, that doesn't need to be open meeting because that's specifically training, plus it's training for all of these people. It's not just you specifically. Um, your board specifically so yeah there, there's going to be some of that if you're in if you question it put together an open meeting notice and all of that just to be safe but definitely not like going to the the schools you know if the schools make it the state you know yeah you can all go to the state to watch the kids play <laughs> so all right anything else about the that little bit um no but we have a different question i think it might have come up because you mentioned foundations oh, okay <laughs> um, excuse me it says um our foundation meets twice per year mm -hmm. we have our foundation foundation meeting at the start of the library board meeting um and it is open to the public does the foundation meeting need to be advertised like the library board meeting is um so uh i'm going to throw out a couple possible scenarios and so please let us know which one fits yours there's a case where the foundation meeting is opened there's not a quorum of library board members there and then it's closed and then the library board meeting follows you're right, they're, they're treated as separate and there's not quorum of library board members at the foundation meeting. That the foundation meeting would not need to be advertised. Another way I've seen this handled is the foundation meeting happens with all of the board member, library board members there, and then it just, they stop their business, then move straight into library board business. That would have to be considered part of the library board meeting because the quorum is there and it's, and they're 
talking specifically about library business. I don't know which method you she would said theirs, theirs would fall under number two there, the second okay. example. Yeah. Yeah. So in that case, you would definitely want to, to consider that a library board meeting with the foundation as an agenda item. Mm. That's probably your best way of handling that, uh, especially okay. if you're expecting the library board to be part of that discussion and, and all of that which is fine. I mean, that's a good way to make sure there's communication going between those two parties so you don't end up kind of doing these separate paths, um, which sometimes happens. So I'm not, I don't want to discourage you from doing that because that is actually a really good thing to do. Uh, just you need to post it as a library board meeting with a foundation component where you're inviting the foundation uh, to be at the meeting. So. That's a really good question. Yeah. So anything else with the previous bit? Uh, okay, so some more clarification about the foundation meeting and the board meeting being kind of together. So uh -huh. can the foundation have a separate agenda, but simply list it as an agenda item on the library board meeting? <laughs> oh, okay, it kind of depends what those items are to be honest, because um, if you're just talking general fundraising, yeah, you probably don't need to list that. But if you're talking about we're planning the next library renovation or, you know, stuff like that, you may want to list that in the- you probably want that as a specific item on the library board meeting as well, yeah. Exactly, and, and so those are, the, those are the type of things where, it, and in that, when in doubt, list it, mm -hmm. yeah. It's it, you're better to bore the citizens with too much information than not give them anything to work on. So uh, I, that's kind of where I would go with that. Um, now that said, um, we mentioned quorum. I don't think I defined that. State statute says your quorum of your board is a majority. So a five person, you have three people being quorum. Um, there are some cases where just having two representatives of your board will do fine, and then you don't need to treat it as an open meeting act. So that is something else to think about. You don't want to continuously do a bunch of two-member meetings with the same group, though, because said that that there's a clause in there that says, you know, basically if you're doing all these other things, we allow to get around open meeting act, but it's obvious that you're doing that, you will still get punished for it. Yeah. So that's something to think about too. You may have some options where, well, we don't need all five. If we just send two, we're still getting all the coordination we need and we don't need to create a, an open meeting for that. So, um, it, and while I'm waiting for more questions, I'm going to talk about consequences here because we are running a little short of time. There are consequences in the act if you violate Open Meetings Act. Two of the big ones is if you hold a meeting that doesn't follow Open Meeting Act regulations, someone could sue and anything that was decided in that meeting could be, uh, the judge could say that decision is now null and void. It never happened either start over, but you can't use any new information that was brought forward in that meeting. You have to start over, which could be very damaging if you're the board is dis discussing contracts or a policy and you're enforcing it, and then there's a suit, and now you can't enforce that policy, but it's still a problem. Now you have to recreate a policy. Uh, so that's one of the big things for the organization. For individuals, a public body that knowingly violates or conspires to violate could be found with uh, these misdemeanors. And um, so there's fines for the individuals, possible jail time if it's a, you know, a common recurrence. So again, there are penalties for this. That's why I'm trying to you know, stress that follow these things so you don't get yourself into trouble. Um, so those are consequences to keep in mind. Uh, there have been a lot of court cases on Open Meeting Act. It's yep. probably one of the most, you know, outside of criminal, it's probably the, one of the most 
litigated things in government. So it does happen. Yeah, but I think there's there's many there's I've heard from more than I am comfortable with libraries talking about their library board or their city boards not following things in the act and just the city or the mayor or city administrator just saying, nah, what's gonna happen though? Yeah. We'll do whatever we want. Mm, this is what so, will happen. And yes, the law does apply to you. There is no one where it there's no we're too small to have to worry about this <laughs> yeah yeah exactly from the, from the villages of you know i don't know if it counts for manawi since there's only one person there <laughs> uh, but for you know anyone larger than that to omaha it covers all of us the same way there you know there's only the posting requirements based on size and then some of the minutes requirements as far as timing of, of posting mm -hmm. it else applies to all of us in, in this state if you're on a public body so yep all right um quickly i want to talk about some upcoming changes these kick in next month um, they were passed here recently so there's one bill uh and i think this touches on an earlier question there was a, a thing that passed in 2021. It got revised here in this last legislative session. Um, so the minutes, the electronic copy can count as the reviewable copy for the public. So if someone comes to the library and says, can I have a copy of the minutes? Offering them a PDF through email counts. You can do that. You do not have to do a print copy on demand if they will accept an electronic copy. The revision mandates that cities over 5,000 makes the agenda and minutes available on their website and must be, remain available for at least six months. So I think the question before was, does this count towards? It's like now it's mandatory for our larger communities. Um, but I don't think it counts as that newspaper posting requirement. Mm -hmm. uh, this is in addition to yes yeah, yeah. Um, and then the website that could be the library or the city as far as i'm understanding it again brand new bill no one's had a suit against it so we could see this kind of get altered over the next year as we see how this actually gets implemented so you know pencil in in 2023 at the end of the, the legislative session to double check this um, we've gone through like four, three or four years of constant tinkering with this, and I'm sure there'll be more bills next year. So, so that's one change. Another change is uh, virtual meetings. All right, so there's a history of this. Before pandemic, there were some interpretations that says, yeah, virtual meetings could happen as long as everyone has the same access. Other people interpreted it and say, no, absolutely not. Pandemic hits, the governor issues executive order, waiving some of the things. So there's more virtual meetings. And then this last year, there's an actual bill that defines it in state law. So here are the requirements. Um, so you can do the virtual meetings as long as everyone has access. However, any actual votes cannot be held during a virtual meeting. It has to be held at an in-person meeting. Hmm. So it, we can't all meet now, but we can vote at the next meeting. Access instructions are made available ahead of time so people can join in. Uh, they don't have to have a live mic, right? So they could be like today, you know, the board has the mics and then you can ask for permission. And here's the really weird part. There has to be at least one physical location where the public can attend physically, have access to all the audio and video, copies of all the documentation being passed around, at least one member of that public body is there in that physical location. Hmm. I, I, that was in the state law. I don't know how long that will last. But, <laughs> okay. Uh, that That's in there. So you can do a virtual meeting, but someone still has to be 
somewhere that has open doors that is open to the public yeah yep the virtual the virtual part being open to the public that can happen as well but you have to also have a physical location for the yep. public to go to again we'll probably see this kind of reinterpreted over the next year as people start saying you know this is not really feasible we might as well just hold a physical meeting yeah and um, I mean, because of what we've gone through over the last couple of years and are still going through with the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, I think forcing people to be physically together is some people are not going to go for that. Yeah. And how we've learned that we can do all this work remotely. There's no reason. Yeah. We've all just seen that it can work. Yeah. So you, you, any any reasoning saying, well, it just we wouldn't be able to make it happen is is null and void now. Um, I wonder about the voting part that you can't do voting virtually. I don't. I, that's the one that I'm more confused about. Why not? Yeah, yeah what is I, I don't know. For that <laughs> I don't understand why that matters. Yeah, I I would expect that we'll probably get some differing interpretations on this. So. Uh, if you ask your city attorney how they're interpreting it, there might be some nuance in there that they would have experience to catch on to that I don't. And so they may tell you something else. And in that case, definitely I would go with them because they have the they have the experience in in finding these things. And they also know what's locally available for that. So but these are questions that um, things that are changed in state law that you'll have to look at uh, yeah. for the coming year. Uh, July. Yeah. Those are only the only two on tap. Um, but seeing some of the bills that came in last year and the year before that, I imagine they will be reintroduced in some form this coming year. So from being a stable bill and changes happening through court cases and new interpretations to actually new legislation, and like I said, that's kind of been, we've gone like three or four years straight where there's something been tweaked. So mm -hmm. this might be something that we keep on our radar at the end of the legislative session. We kind of review what's going on. Um, See how it works in practice if people decide, yeah, no, no, this isn't working. Because <laughs> we do have a question. If there's a physical location, but a virtual meeting option is there for people concerned about COVID board members, can you vote? I guess that's what we're not sure. Or, well, from what it says there on that, one line no yeah but and, and here's and another the people who are virtual just abstain and then only the people physically together do the voting if they are a quorum yeah, ah. yeah and, and so this is one of those things where it seems to have conflicts in actual doing you yeah. know we have the legal theory and then the actual implementation seem to be kind of weird and this also doesn't really address the fact let's say the majority of the the board is in person but mm -hmm. there's an attendee attending through telephone or a video link um because that's handled differently if you say this is a physical meeting but this one person is attending through webinar but they have the the speakers and microphones so the the people in the meeting not just the board members but the the attendees can see what's going on they can talk to that person mm -hmm. you have full access but they're virtual that is different than this virtual meeting where there's one person physically so th there's some weird stuff that will probably get ironed out through the year on that last update um because it just seems like there's too many weird things on this where you can just say well we're going to have three people in that room two people virtual, so it's a physical meeting. I, you know, I, I don't know. I think this yeah. thing wasn't really well thought out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it needs some clarification, yeah. All right. Um, so just to close, again, you'll have the slides, you'll also have handouts. Full text, the current state statute. Um, this will, if you've ever looked at uh, the legislature's website, you can go chapter and it breaks it down like 84, 1407, 84, 1408, and those are different web pages. This link will get you everything considered Open Meetings Act in one page. So you can take it, put it to Word, to 
to do nice line breaks for posting if you want. Um, the Attorney General also has a page on his notes on how he inter excuse me, interprets Open Meeting Act. So That's that, the one that I always end up on when I do a search, I think, is the Attorney General's page. <laughs> yeah. So that I will say that it seems to not include the past two years, maybe past three years, new tweaks to Open Meeting Act. Um, <laughs> but it gets the majority of it and how he would prosecute if a case came to his desk. So that is important to know. Um, so at this point, there's general questions. I know I ran long. I apologize for, for that. Actually, we're not very long, late. Other, anyways, we started a little after 10 o'clock as it was, waiting for people to get settled in. So oh, we are fine. Okay. Um, and we'll go as long as people do have questions. This is all being recorded. If you do need to step out, um, leave. You only allotted the till, you know, um, 11 a.m. Central for this. You can go and you can watch the recording later for anything you missed. Yeah. Uh, we do have a couple more questions. Uh, Maybe does not have a client. Okay, so I had to read this one because it was long. Okay, so going back to talking about, and these are both talking about foundations related to, um, but if you do have any other questions, go ahead and type them into the question section and we'll definitely get everything um, answered that you have here today before Scott um, leaves. Uh, so first one we have here right now, would it be wise when the foundation is creating committees to make sure the committee does not have a quorum of library board members on it? Yes. Uh, yes. Especially if you have thinking, other yeah. foundation members that you can put on there that aren't library board members. Um, it, it would probably be wise for the subcommittee uh, to, to be mostly non-library board members in that case. Um, I'll also throw out, if your foundation includes a bunch of library board members, you may want to consider changing that. A few years ago, one of our communities got into some trouble in the in the public view they weren't illegal but the public turned on the library foundation because it's mostly library board members and people were making a stink about okay here's city folks telling what to do with private money and it, it just didn't taste right for some folks mm -hmm. that is something to think about on the larger scale is um having a more distinct difference between foundation and library board members but back to your original question yeah if it's just two library board members and a bunch of other foundation members you're probably okay with having a subcommittee doing that, mm -hmm. that without yeah, just play it safe that know. way yeah absolutely yep. um and that does you know having a, a foundation yes it is for the benefit of the library but yeah that kind of confuses me that it's you know, the library board members are all the foundation i always thought of it as a separate thing that is being yeah. put together by uh, community members um, and maybe with like a board member or someone involved to keep, you know, like you say, keep the communication lines opening open, but yeah. mostly someone in the community wants to be supportive of the library. Same thing with a friends group. They want to just be supportive of the library, but they're not in charge of running the library. That's what makes it different. Yeah. Um, from what I've heard from, from various uh, folks in our profession who, who got into it before I did in this state, um, back, you know, there was kind of this push for new library buildings back in the 80s and stuff. And at that time, best practices being told were, yeah, have your entire library board plus a few other community members be your foundation so you can get the grants and all of that. So, it, you know, they were just doing what was suggested at that point in making up their foundations for the first time in many of our communities. Mm. Um, things have changed you know, since then. So it might be time to rethink your, your membership of those foundations. Pay attention to public perception. Yes, especially if it's a fundraising group because public perception is going to affect how well they can do at that task. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and we have one more question here. If anybody else has any other questions, get them typed in and we'll get to them. But this is our last one at the moment. And um, it's about when you were talking about Open Meetings Act, again, foundations. So library boards are covered by the Open Meetings Law and library foundations are not? Um, generally, no. Generally, a foundation is a separate 501c3 and so do not fall under Open Meeting Act. 
But like we mentioned, many of our library foundations include a significant number of library board members. Mm -hmm. And so even though the foundation shouldn't be because of the makeup of the people at that table talking about library business or also library board members, now you have to act under Open Meeting Act. Right. So it depends on who's on the library foundation board when it when the act becomes needed, which is right. a reason to not have too many of them on that board. Um, foundations right. are not public bodies. That's the thing. They're private. Exactly. That's uh, why the Open Meetings Act does not apply to the foundations. They're not a public um, body. Yeah. And like a library board or a city council or whatever. And this is this is one of the reasons why some of our smaller communities don't do friends or foundation because the number of people available who would <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> be involved in libraries, um, there's not that many extra besides who could be on the board, you know, who's on the board. And so bringing who's already in involved in and, and supporting and helping the library. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I understand that's that's the way a lot of you know, it's like you don't have much choice because there's only so many people who want to be active. Um, and so you kind of have to make do with what you've got. Um, uh, that said, a library foundation does not have to have the same residency requirements as boards generally do. So True. you may want to think about people outside city limits for a foundation if you have strict controls on your library board being yeah. strictly within you know the city limits that's right uh, because there are people in your rural area that may use your library and want and depend on it and support are supportive of it mm -hmm. but because we're such a rural state don't happen to live within the city limits yep yeah and, and that whole distinction of on you know residency for boards and stuff that's a whole other issue and i don't want <laughs> we, we can spend a lot of time on what does state law say versus what does your local ordinance say but that's mm -hmm. a whole other topic <laughs> yes and we do have a page on our li library commission's website about that um a few years ago richard miller did um my predecessor dug into that because it was a big topic and it is linked off of our library board manual and i did just re we did just recently have it looked over again by uh thanks from the municipalities just to make sure is this all still correct and, and none of the laws have changed so we do have something that does dig into that if it is something that you and we do have libraries ask the, ask ask me about that a lot who what are the rules about who can be on our board um and as guys that yeah that's a whole we won't get into that right now it's not related to open meetings act but you yeah. can look up about residency and library boards on our website and ask us if you want more discussion. Yeah, yeah. If there's interest, I'm sure we can come up with folks to do a session on that down the line. Yeah, we'll see. Absolutely. All right. Um, I don't I don't have any more questions coming up on the questions. I don't see anything in the chat. Um, if anybody has anything desperate you want to ask of Scott right now, get it in. Otherwise, I think we might be ready to wrap things up for today. I'll keep the questions open just in case anybody does have anything while I'm just doing my wrap up here. No problem. Feel free to type in something to think about it. Um, so thank you so much, Scott, uh, for coming on to this today. We were had been talking about doing this for a while um, on and off and changes, like you said, changes kept happening to the law. So it was like, well, do we do it now? Do we wait? Same thing with getting posters um, to send out to everybody. I was actually looking into getting them last year and then wait, there's new things, changes coming again. So, all right, well, let's wait for the next changes. Um, so I'm glad we were able to do this. And I know you did this session also at your, was it at the training extravaganza or at a castle meeting? Uh, a castle meeting. Yes, one of our director meetings, yes. Um, so I think it's great that we have this, um, I have gotten this done for as um, the current status as of today, uh, as of June 22nd, 2022, and what's coming in July, this is the status of Open Meetings Act. Uh, if major changes happen again, we'll do this again. <laughs> all right. Yeah, all right. Thank you so much. I am going to pull a presenter to my screen to do my wrap up here. So we should have that over here. There we go. Um, and as Scott says, I do have his link for um, the slides. And so that will be included with the recording. 
Um, um, this is our main Encompass Live website. You can uh, use your search engine of choice and type in Encompass Live, the name of the show, and this will come up in your search results. Our upcoming shows are all listed here for the next couple of months, but our archived linked um, shows are right here. Most recent one will go at the top of the page. Today's show will be there. Uh, should be up by end of the day tomorrow, maybe Friday, um, depending on how quickly I can get in, get it done and uh, go to webinar and YouTube cooperating with me. Um, there'll be a link to the recording and then a link to um, the slides that uh, Scott provided. So I'm going to hear um, from the show from two weeks ago. Everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show get an email from me letting you know when the recording is available. We also post it up to our social media. We do um, Twitter and Instagram, and we do have um, links, if you see here, we have a Facebook page, which I have over here. Um, we post on there as well, so if you'd like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. Here's a reminder to log in today's show. Um, information about our presenter, and um, when we had our schedule change, and then here, the last um, recording. So um, we'll post on here and on Twitter when we do have the recording available. Um, if you do want to follow us on social media, we use NCOMP Live abbreviation is our hashtag for the show, anywhere where we post things about it. On our archived shows here, there is a search feature, so you can search for any topic if you want to um, to see if we've done a show about it. Uh, do pay attention. Um, this is our full show archives. Um, you can limit it just the most recent 12 months if you want to, but this is our full show archives going back to when Encompass Live premiered, which is in January 2009. Um, so where are we going on 10, 12? A long time of years worth of presentation of recordings here. Um, but as long as we have somewhere to host all of these um, and have them um, up there, we will have them available to you. So just pay attention to the, pay attention to the original broadcast date of anything. Um, some shows will be fine and stand the test of time and still be good, useful information, but some things may become old and outdated. Resources may have changed drastically. Links may be broken. Um, things might no longer exist anymore. Um, but, you know, we are librarians. We keep things for historical purposes oftentimes, and we will keep these out there as well. So that wraps up for today's show. Thank you, everybody, for being here today. Thank you so much, Scott, for doing this. And on such short notice, I really appreciate this. Happy to help. It's great to have you on. Um, next week, our, um, and I'll also mention while we're looking at this here, um, as I said, the last two weeks of shows got canceled and move things moved around. Um, the one that was supposed to be today on retirement, we're still waiting to find a date for that. But the week before, which was our CA, CES 2022 and Libraries Presence show presentation has been already rescheduled to July 27th. It is going to be part of, it'll be, it'll be our pretty sweet tech session for that day. Um, so if you were interested in about hearing about the consumer um, electronic show um, from Buy and Pitchman that will be now on July 27th and I did announce that and it's on our calendar now so if that's what you're looking for go and register for it over there um, next week's show is our pretty sweet tech for June last Wednesday of every month is pretty sweet tech day when Amanda Sweet comes on and talks about the techie related things and next Wednesday she's gonna be talking about what is meaningful work and how can libraries help uh, so uh, definitely join us for that or sign up for any of our other shows we have listed here. We have June, July, and August dates uh, booked. I'm going to check my calendar. So, and then keep an eye for when that retirement send, uh, session is rescheduled. There was a lot of interest in that. Um, so we will definitely find a new date for that sometime in August or September. So thank you, everybody. And we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye-bye.